Hello YouTube, I'm PC, today I'm making a tutorial for you guys. Today's tutorial we're going to be making a prime number generation interface. Alright, now you may notice that I look a little bit different from the way I looked at my previous tutorials. That's because I recorded those tutorials, well I recorded the previous ones in Thanksgiving break, and this particular introduction I actually recorded beginning of Christmas break. So that was like six months ago. So yeah, I, I, I recorded all the introductions, but I don't... This tutorial and the next one, they don't seem to be on my computer anymore. I have no idea where they went. I must have forgot to transfer them from the camera or something like that. I'm not really sure. But anyway, that's why I'm uh, re-recording this introduction. So, as I said, the topic for today is a prime number generation interface. This is actually a tutorial that's kind of near and dear to me. We're, we're going to be talking about how to make the interface, but we're not actually talking about how to generate the prime numbers. I may make a separate tutorial later on on how to make a prime number generation program, but this tutorial is just about the interface. So it's near and dear to me because I, I, it took me a long time to make the program to generate the prime numbers. It, yeah, it took me a while and it took a lot of effort and now that I've made it, I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of how it turned out and it generates prime numbers pretty quickly. Yeah, there's a little bit of a story behind that, but I'll, t I'll tell you that if I decide to make a prime number generation tutorial. So, so this tutorial is going to be split into two parts. The first part is going to be the interface, because this is actually has a, one of a more complicated interface compared to the other stuff that we've done. So, so I figured there's there's enough content there to make a whole video about. And part two, we're going to make interactive. So we're going to make the buttons actually do stuff, and we're going to make it, you know, all the bells and whistles actually work rather than just be there. So yeah, so yeah, two part two parts. The last thing I want to talk about before um I'm, we move on to the tutorial is threads. I, I was designing this tutorial, and uh, I noticed an issue, cause um. Well, the way it works is you type in a number and then you hit list and then it lists all the numbers below it. So if it, all the prime numbers below it. So if you put in 100 and hit list, it lists all the numbers below, all the prime numbers below 100. So for 100, it'll, it'll be pretty much instantaneous. So if you try bigger numbers like a million, 10 million, it'll take a little longer. I think my algorithm is good enough that it'll it'll get 10 million in 20, 30 seconds probably, maybe a few minutes. But even so, the problem is that during that time period it'll freeze the program. You, it, for as far as the user, from the user's angle, it looks like it might even crash. So, in order to fix this, we had to use something called threads. Because we don't, of course, we don't want it to look like it's crashed. That's, that's bad for the user. The user needs to know what's happening and they need to have the option to cancel if they, if they want. But in order for the user to have that power, we need to use threads. So what threads is, is it allows you to perform multiple operations at once. You may think that's kind of how it works already, but the way, really the way it works is when you make a program, you can actually trace what the computer is thinking at any point in time in the code. It's never at two places at the same time. Even with the cursive programs or iterative programs, it's never on two places at the same time. It just runs so fast that it seems like it's at two places at the same time. You'd use threads when you have a process that actually takes a long, t long time for the computer to manage or process. And when that happens, it's visible to the user that it's having trouble getting, getting it done. So we need to run that in the background while we take care of all the normal stuff at the same time. So in order to run that background, you use threads. And I could probably make a separate video all about threads. I probably will make a separate video all about threads because that's a pretty big topic and it's something you definitely want to know if you want to get good at programming. Yeah, that's one reason why this is a long video because I have to add that on there too. So that's that. Um, let's move on to the first part of the tutorial. All right then, so let's get started. So as an introduction, that was not the original introduction. I re-recorded re that. So as you might be able to tell, from this, this isn't the original recording of this tutorial either. The original recording, the raw footage of it, was over two hours long. It was me rambling through, uh, typing out all the code, and explaining as I went, and that, that took a while. It, I did the same thing in the fill in the blank tutorial, and I'm not sure how many, how many of you watched it, but that, that, that turned out to be a pretty long, long video. So for this tutorial, I decided to look at the code that I already wrote. I'm going to go through explain the code rather than, rather than type it out. And hopefully, I'll be able to get this video done in like 20 minutes. Fingers crossed. And, um, and the result will hopefully be the same amount of learning in a much smaller pack. So uh, please let me know if um, you like this way of, of me sh teaching, or if you prefer the way I did the fill, fill in the blank tutorial. This way is probably going to be a little bit easier. I'm hoping it'll be better for you guys, but yeah. So that's that's that that's the the plan right now. So 
You might be wondering, why don't I have Notepad++ open? Why, why am, I'm, am I not typing down code? Well, when I first made, made sort of what worked with stuff where you had to actually think think out a layout beforehand, like with HTML, I, I hit um, kind of a roadblock. So when I made games, I just sort of popped things in as I, as I, popped things in as I went and made new things. I, I didn't put much thought beforehand in how the layout or interface was going to be set up, which isn't that important when you're making games, but when you're making web pages or when you're making something with a pretty exact layout, it's, it's kind of important to have that figured out beforehand. So for that reason, I'm going to go ahead and explain to you how the layouts can be set up for this tutorial. Okay, so here is our window. All right, and we're gonna have to split up into three boxes. So we have this box down here, and this box over here, and then that leaves this big area over here. And I'm gonna call name, give them a certain type of naming scheme. I'm gonna call this top right one. I'm gonna call them that one center, and I'm gonna make that one Arial Black because Arial Black is my favorite font. And hopefully you guys see it better. Okay, so this one center. And then this one to the left is we're gonna call that one west. And this bottom one we're gonna call well let's see this bottom one we're gonna call south. And um, the reason I chose to, this certain naming scheme is because we're using a border layout, and this is the naming scheme that it uses. But we'll get more into that later. So now let's talk a little bit about what elements we're gonna add to this. So this center is gonna be taken up by one big object, and that's gonna be a J text area. Alright, and then this section over here is going to fill, be filled with a bunch of J buttons. So let me change my color again. So we have a J button there, and that's going to be called test. We're going to have a J button here, and that's going to be called list. We're going to have a J button in here, and that one's going to be called uh, clear. All right, so I'm just make it clear, clear. Let me, I'll just put a little line here indicating that they're all J buttons. Gotta have rounded edges. So those are J buttons. All right. Okay, this bottom part is a bunch of elements. Um, I probably should prepare better because I don't fully remember them all. Okay, they have five elements. So first we have something called input, and that is going to be a J label. Okay, and then we have a box which will represent that, which is where the user can actually input stuff. This input is saying what the box says, the box will you use, and that box is going to be a J text field. Okay. Then we have something called a we have a J progress bar, which will show us the progress of our calculations. Let me just fill it in like that. That's our progress bar, and that is a J progress bar, and then um, we have another J label running on space primes found. Well, let's type it out. This doesn't need to be perfect as long as you understand. That's supposed to fit in there. One of the wonders of swinging is you don't have to do all the math to make sure it fits. I made the same mistake when I was recording it the first time. Probably should have had the foresight to think this. Through. So the primes found is J label. And then we have under it is we have another JTEXT field. Okay. Now they got that taken care of. Let me explain to you the usage a little bit. So, all right. So we have all these buttons here. These are buttons are pretty much the only thing the user can interact with. They can they can also put stuff in this input area. So these three buttons in this input area. The rest is all handled by the computer or by the, our program. So when you hit test, it will look at the number you put here. So if you put down five there. It'll test it for whether it's prime or not, and then out here to output whether five is prime or not. Got it? Hit list. It'll it'll look at the number you put here, and it'll list out all the prime numbers below that number. So if you put in 100 here, it'll list out all the prime numbers below 100. Okay? Hit clear. It'll clear everything in this window. Okay? But this prime is found area will keep track of how many prime numbers you've found. So if you down put test, it'll say either one or zero in here, depending on whether that was a prime or not. You put list, this will be an ongoing number. It'll keep growing as you discover more numbers. And once it's finished, this number will represent how many prime numbers are below that number. So if you put down 100 here, put list, then this will end up showing how many prime numbers there are below 100. And then uh, 
especially this list will can take a long time, so this progress bar will represent how far how close we are to finishing that those calculations. And then clear is going it's probably easy to still just clear everything in this window because it it can get really muddled. Okay, I was aiming for twenty minutes, but we're already seven and a half minutes in. Hopefully I can or seven and a half minutes without the intro. Um, hopefully I can still pull this off in a reasonable fashion. <sighs> Alright, now let's move on to the code. Alright then, here's here's our code. Step one, we're going to initialize all of our elements. So you see I put a comment here to organize everything a little bit. This stuff in the center, this stuff in the west, this stuff in the south. And before that we have a big panel which will organize everything. So in the center we just have J text area. And uh, I'd like to point out that we have panels in west and south, but we don't have one for center. That's because when you don't put a panel in there, and we add something directly to a section, it'll just expand that whole section, which in this case is what we want. A lot of times it's not what you want, a lot of times you want to be more organized than that. But in this case we want JTEX area to just expand to the whole area. And we have JScroll Paint, which I I sort of referenced my chatbot tutorial, but I never actually made a tutorial dealing with JScroll Paint. What it does is, well first off it takes um, it takes a JTEX area or, or some sort of swing component as the first parameter, which is what's going to be contained by this scroll panel, what we're going to be, it's going to, what it's going to scroll through. So in this case, it's scrolling through our text area. So we put our text area as the first argument, and these next two are its uh, scroll bar behavior. So sometimes you want to have a horizontal and vertical scroll bar. In the case of image editors, something like that. Sometimes you don't. Like in Word, you usually don't have a horizontal scroll bar. And this says what these indicate is when they're used. This, this says when they're used. So you can either have them use always, or have them used when they're needed. So if the our JTEX area grows beyond the point where it fits in the box, then it can be there only when it's necessary, or never, in which case it's sort of fixed. So in this case, we never want to have our horizontal there. We want our vertical to be there when our text area grows to the point where we need one. And these are constants from um, JSCrool Pane. These are actually just numbers, z probably like 0, 1, or 2, or something like that. But they're stored as variables inside JSCrool Pane, so that way we don't have to memorize the numbers. So that's what these come from. And you can look them up in the API, of course. Um, I'm not going to be doing this the whole time, but I guess I'll go ahead and look this one up, just to show you guys how you can look, how you can do this. So we can type in Java JSCrool Pane, and then you click the first one, and then you can look through here and see everything. So in this case we have um, but, but we look at the constructor. Where is our constructor? Now ah, here's a constructor. This is this is only used right here. So you can see the information here. And then here it explains to you that uh, the, scroll, the scroll bar policy specifies when the scroll bar is displayed. For example, visible policy is da 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 and um, you can see that that's one of them but we can search for more by going into the fields. So right here field summary oh, I thought that was it I guess okay looks like it inherited from drill, uh, scroll pane content so you can see them all down here if you need if you so needed them okay um, alright so that's how th this is set up and then comes west which we have our panel and then we have our three buttons you should know how to do that fairly easily we just have three buttons and that's text we want inside the buttons south uh, the panel a label text field um, progress bar is new, but we don't. It's not. It's a fairly simple constructor. It's not, nothing there. Um, another label with primes found and a uh, text field. Fairly simple. And by the way, if you didn't remember, this ten is how many columns are in the text field. Remember, text field does not have any rows. It's only one row every time. Well, one row. All right. So we go into our main. In the main, we create a new object of this class to make it not referenced from a static context. And then in here, we set up everything. So where we initialized up here, down here we add all the components. So first we go through our standard swing stuff, you know, setting the name of the window, setting the size, resizable behavior, close operation, which I actually forgot in my tic-tac-toe tutorial. That's the reason why I wasn't closing, why I wasn't closing command prompt, because all of the window was closed. The program wasn't actually closing, okay? And then we, here we have we set layout to border layout. That's a new layout. We'll look into that. And, well, I'll look into that now. I, I told you guys I wasn't going to do this, but I'm doing it again because border layout's new, and that's that's one of the points of this tutorial to learn border layout. That's one of the big key points. Border layout. Here we have it right here. So what it does is organize into this fashion. So you can use any or all or 
of these um, sections, I guess. In our case, we're using center, west, and south. Hence my naming in paint.net over here. Center, west, and south. So that's border layout. It, it can be used in a lot of different applications. Websites are kind of designed like this. Oftentimes you have a navigation bar, ads on either side, and the center. You can kind of think of a lot of games where it would be like this. A lot of times you have stuff happening here, and then you have some options along the side, as, as in our case. So yeah, border layout's a good one to know. So okay, so we're setting the layout to border layout over here, and then we're messing with our primes list. So primes list is the text area, remember? So just a couple of preference things. It's not editable. The user can't change anything. Line wrap is true, so it doesn't keep expanding horizontally. If it reaches the end, it'll go to the next line. And I want to. I don't want words to be split up, so that's why I did this this thing. Okay. So once I got the preferences set up, I added it to border layout that center. When you add things to a border layout, the first argument is which element you want to add, and the second one is where you want it to be added. So in this case, you want it to be added to the center, so it's border layout dot center. All right, and then we, in the west, we set the layout to a grid layout. You should be comfortable with that, seeing as we used it in our tic-tac-toe. In this case, it's only going to be one column and ten rows. I could have done three rows because I'm only putting three things in there, but then that will stretch, stretch out all of our uh, buttons over the whole area, and I felt like ten looked nice. You can change it however you feel it works best. We add all the buttons, and then we add that panel, okay we add all the buttons to the panel which we called west, and then we add the panel to the west section of the border layout there we go, okay now we have all of our elements down here we have uh, progress this, uh, this is our progress bar, so by set string I'm setting the uh, what's displayed on there, so we set that to waiting and set string painted, yeah we set the string, so we want there to be a string painted by default, that's false. So that's why I said that's true. Primes found number of primes we found. We don't want it to be editable. We want that to change, be changed by the program only. Okay, and we add everything, all those five things, to the panel, the south panel. Then we add that panel to the border layout. And then last but not least, we add the panel with the border layout to the thing. And then we set visible to true. So that was everything. Originally, I wanted to uh, split this video into two parts and make the first part about organizing everything and then make the second part about actually making it interact with the, my primes class. So the first part, let's see, that was 50 minutes and now I've got it done in 25, so 50% faster. That's that's pretty good. I was thinking we could do this in just one video, but now uh, I guess two parts would be good. So this will this will set up everything, all the vis visuals are set up now. So um, it'll look like this. This is what it looks like when you run it now. Of course, none of these will do anything, but you can type in here. You can't type in here or here, which we want. You can see waiting is painted over here, and we have all our buttons set up here. So, um, you know, stay tuned for the next part of this tutorial. I'll see you guys there.